I'm Stephen Herb, director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, uh, sponsored in the Commonwealth by Penn State University Libraries and Dean Barbara Dewey. Welcome to the sixth annual awarding of the Lynn Ward Prize for Graphic Novel of the Year. Lynn Ward Prize honors Mr. Ward's influence in the development of the graphic novel and celebrates the gift of an extensive collection of Ward's wood engravings, original book illustrations, and other graphic art donated to Penn State University Libraries by his daughters Robin Ward Savage and Nanda Whedon Ward. First issued in 2011 and administered by the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Center for the Book and the Library of Congress, uh, the prize is presented annually to the best graphic novel published in the previous calendar year by a living, look, see, he's alive, um, U.S. or Canadian citizen or resident. Before I introduce the prize committee chair, who will introduce and present the award, I'd like to recognize several people, sponsors and supporters of the Lynn Ward Prize who are here today. Barbara Dewey, by the way, you don't have to stand up, maybe wave, and if you guys want to hold your applause till they're all done, there are 72 of them. <laughs> Barbara Dewey, uh, Dean of the University Libraries, waving in the middle in the back, uh, and Dean of Scholarly Communications, who not only sponsors the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, but also contributes the prize money uh, associated with this award. Uh, we also have Nancy Eaton right next to her, um, Dean Emerita of the University Libraries and Scholarly Communications, who restarted the center back in 2000 and who approved the founding of this prize. Ann Langley, Associate Dean for Research Collections, wearing bright orange, and scholarly communication, who also supports the work of the center. We have the faculty and staff of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book here today, our Nicole Miyashiro, our editor, Suzanne Shamrock, our collections assistant, Elisa Cahoy, assistant director, and our amazing outreach coordinator, Carolyn Wearmuth, who manages the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year details for this prize. Mara Katria and Jeffrey Unger are videographers. Uh, I don't know if Rebecca's here or not, but I want to acknowledge uh, she is, I think, the Library Learning Services Department for their sponsorship, Athena Jackson uh, for the Eberly Family Special Collections Library, Scott T. Smith, Smith, sorry, how do you screw Smith up? Uh, <laughs> representing, <laughs> yeah, it is a first. Uh, representing the sponsorship of both the Department of English and the College of the Liberal Arts uh, one of our real champions uh, outside the libraries, and our advisory board, Elisa Stern Cohoy, assistant director, Will Hutton, I don't think is here, but our retired visual artist in the Department of Public Relations who served on our committee, uh, Joel Pretty, associate pr professor of graphic design, um, and Harlan Ritchie, uh, artist, and also uh, from our engineering library, Scott T. Smith, I got it that time, again, and Sandra Stelz, rare books curator. It is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the 2016 Lynn Ward Prize, John McComas. John holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Penn State and puts his 20-year fascination for all facets of the comics medium to good use as a full-time staffer at the Comic Swap in State College, Pennsylvania. John. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me just a second here. Welcome to the ceremony for the Lind Ward Prize uh, 2016. Uh, before we get things started, I would like to introduce my fellow members of the jury from this year. First member of our jury, aside from me, Kendra Boileau is editor-in-chief of the Penn State University Press and the acquiring editor for the Press's Graphic Medicine book series. Uh, in addition, Colin Culture, creator of the Real Batman Chronology Project, has a Master of Arts in Cinema Studies from NYU is the manager of youth media education at BRIC in Brooklyn, New York. Dustin Perna graduated from Penn State in spring of 2006 with a bachelor's degree in advertising and public relations, and has a fervent interest in comics and graphic novels. He is currently a public relations intern at Philadelphia Advertising Agency. And finally, Beth Sayala is a reference and instruction librarian at Penn State University's Beaver Campus. Um, I believe some of us are here today. I'll take this minute to have you guys stand. We also, by the way, I don't think Colin Kalsher was able to be here. That is not unprecedented, but he, in fact, um, sent his parents. That is a Penn State first for sure. If you'd like to stand as well, please feel, feel uh, um, welcome. Their names, pardon me. Keith, Keith and Sal Kalsher are here with us today. Um, 
So I'm going to get things kicked off. All told, we spent well over 100 combined hours this year at the task of choosing our recipients. So I hope you'll very briefly join me in thanking me and my fellow jurists. Um, I'm going to kick off today by taking maybe the unusual step of reading you the four bullet points on my note sheet. One, the term critical theory is underlined. There's an exclamation point and a frowny face. Two, I'm going to briefly pause for you guys to express your contempt. Three, <laughs> subvert audience expectations of being bored for five to seven minutes. Four, talk about the book, but that's a grammar error. That's a rare grammatical error. Talk about the books. And finally, um, at the bottom, there's a star. And it says, don't screw up the PowerPoint, but I'm probably just going to wipe that one. I'm going to screw up the PowerPoint somehow, I guarantee you. Uh, in school, I was an avid reader of the famous um, and strident literary criticism of Dr. Harold Bloom. One of the takeaways from those studies, um, other than the obvious that I probably should have gotten a degree in hard or even a soft science, is that great literature, unimpeachably great literature, operates on a paradox engine. Great literature must be in conversation with its historical predecessors, um, but it must also rad radically change that conversation with novelty. Great literature must be universally relevant and timelessly wise, while also remaining specific enough to its task so as to not become diluted. Um, what we are basically here to, uh, today to tell you is that all three of the books that we're going to honor today inhabit that intersection completely and fully. We are going to confer two honors books before uh, making our award. The first book is this really magnificent, um, really magnificent memoir by Lucy Neasley called Displacement. Um, this is maybe, I've tested the patience of extemporaneous speech right now, so I'm just going to read straight from our ad copy. Our ad copy was fantastic, by the way, if you ask me. Um, Lucy Kenise Lee's Displacement is a perfect memoir comic. I co-signed that, by the way. Her vibrant watercolor illustrations humanizes with candor and grace the reality of caring for loved ones as they age. The narrative of her grandfather's journal from World War II, woven in with harrowing cruise experiences, is a crucial touchstone, reminding us that her grandparents are so much more than what they can express to the outside world in the present. The clever metaphor of displacement is reflected upon throughout the book. With displacement, the literal and figurative impact of the cruise experience gives insight into Neasley's relationship with her grandparents and the contemplation of her own mortality. Paradoxically, the opening pages to each daily entry depicting gradually rising water can be read in two ways, the growing possibility of drowning in a sea of troubles, or as a lightning that comes with the lifting of a weight, the emptying of a hull as the cruise comes to an end. Neasley definitely conveys both throughout the book. Um, as Steve mentioned, I, uh, or maybe he didn't entirely mention, but I work at the comic book store downtown. My, if you'll allow me a brief sales pitch, this is a memoir that I absolutely loved. When I tell that to friends that know me well, their jaws hit the floor because I can't stand memoirs. Please, please read this book. Consider it um, strongly. The next book that we afforded a honors to is Russian Olive to Red King by Catherine and Stuart Eminen. Um, this, is, this is a really, really sad book. I hope that you all read it someday. Um, it is that rare work of fine art that succeeds at cross purposes. It is both successfully avant-garde and profoundly relatable. Stewart's light, clean, and deliberate artistic choices are the ideal counterpoint to Catherine's searing and devastating story of loss and grief, all of which leads to the novel's formally upsetting and innovative coda. Um, the book was outstanding, and I really, really hope, on top of all the books I'm telling you you have to spend money on, that you actually read this book someday. Um, and now I would like to, basically, confer our, our graphic novel prize to Nick Susanis for his novel Unflattening. Our ad copy was really, really good. So once again, uh, Unflattening is an innovative, multi-layered graphic novel about comics, art, and visual thinking. The book's integrated landscape of image and text takes the reader on an Odyssean journey through multiple dimensions, inviting us to view the world from alternate visual vantage points. These perspectives are inspired by a broad range of ideas from astronomy, mathematics, optics, philosophy, ecology, art, literature, cultural studies, and comics. The graphic styles and layouts in this work are engaging and impressive and succeed in making the headiest of ideas accessible. In short, unflattening takes sequential art to the next level. 
It takes graphic narrative into the realm of theory, and it puts theory into practice with this artful presentation of how imaginative thinking can enrich in, uh, our understanding of the world. Nick, we loved your novel. We completely loved your novel. If you'd like to come on up, I'd like to present you with a prize. Thank you. Thanks to the Pennsylvania Center for the book and the jurors and all the people who made it possible and all of you for coming out. It's a big, yeah, this is, it's been a really good year and I'm really grateful to be here and to have this opportunity to speak with you all. I want to start by just saying a little bit about Ward. I, I think the history of, of comics is really a retroactive one. Um, I, th I think in our attempts to sort of defend this medium that has had been on the defensive for a long time to, uh, to, to justify its existence. We've sort of looked backwards to find a lineage for it. And Ward's work is sort of singularly out there saying, yes, this is, this is stuff we take seriously, and this is out there, and it's part of comics. I don't know that Ward would have considered it then, but we certainly do now. So I was just, I started looking through some of his images and I was uh, somewhat intrigued that um, I had some nice overlaps, which made me feel good. It's a little dangerous to put mine next to his because, well, I won't say why, but still always room to improve is all I'll say. Um, but I was really pleased by that and this was sort of startling to me. I don't know if this is in there, but this is an unpublished page of his on the left and that's from mine on the right. Um, but I had no idea about this till I just happened to be Googling it. Um, and on top of that, uh, so I teach comics in my class, and I teach comics classes, and I was in the middle of a term teaching both This One Summer and Fran, which were the two previous year winners, and Building Stories this term before, and several of the, the honor, honorees. So to be in the company of people making these works that I have such high respect for um, was really, really powerful to me. So I'm really very grateful for it, and I recommend, I mean, every book that you guys have looked at is, is really exciting. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to make comics. And uh, like many people in my generation maybe, um, I grew up with superhero comics. I had a much older brother who read them to me and as a result, Batman is my first word. Um, I have managed somewhat accidentally to replicate that with my daughter. Uh, it wasn't intentional, honestly. Um, and I made comics as a little kid, and uh, in high school, I made, or junior high and high school, I put out my own comic, uh, Locker Man, which, <laughs> I don't know why everybody thinks that's so funny. <laughs> I don't think it's that funny. Um, yeah, it was a part parody and part serious, but, uh, but I was really pleased. He makes a reappearance, a sort of cameo appearance in the, what was my dissertation in, the, in Unflattening, in my chapter on imagination. And so I did this all the time in school and, and all the way through high school. I was very into making comics and, and it was very important to me. Uh, but when I went to undergrad, the time I went to school, comics were not something you studied and they weren't really something you did if you thought of yourself as an intellectual. Um, I studied mathematics because I wanted to do the things that, you know, that I, I thought I had to do in school. And I loved studying, I'm not, I'm not disappointed in that in the least. But, um, but I think it's, there's an important thing here in that when you study mathematics and you tell people that, uh, the response you get is, oh, you're so smart. And you, if, I don't, are there any mathematicians in the room? You know this. And so now I'm mo mostly known for the work I make in comics. And what do people tell me now? They say, oh, you're so talented. So the thing I think is that, you know, the truth is that I was a very talented mathematician. I was very clever at figuring things out. But I don't know how well I understood it. And I think in making comics, I make work that is way smarter than I can make without it. And I think a big part of what I am interested in my teaching and in this work and in work to come is that I think this is a really unhealthy divide. Or we, you know, it's unhealthy for the mathematicians or that side to think that there is a side and that they're not capable of working visually. And then the flip side of it is to think that what artists do is not smart is a uh, is not true, it's not about, ta I mean, it may be about talent, whatever that is, but it's really, really thoughtful things and we think a lot through images. So I see in my own history, our, our perception of comic has changed dramatically, where now I can teach students who've never even thought about comics on how to use comics in their own classrooms. So it's a really exciting change. Um, so in my case, so the comics sort of, I kept making them, but it stayed in the back burner for a long time. 
And around the 2004 election, I, I was involved in the arts in Detroit and uh, asked to be, oops, trigger happy. Um, I was asked to be in a, a political art show and I had about four days to do it. So I made some comics addressing the election uh, and I, I very quickly I abandoned sort of uh, the, the avatar of myself telling the stories and turn to visual metaphor. So this is all about voting or, you know, a show of hands. And it's all this sort of visual, I did everything with hands. And you'll see that kind of thing recur. Shortly after that, I was asked, uh, uh, we organized a show on games and art in Detroit. And my buddy said, why don't you do the essay in comics form? So I did this long form comic dealing with the history of games, how games work, and then applying it to a sort of philosophy of life through games. And, and it's this piece that really, when I decided to go back to school, I said, this is the kind of work I can do. I can make really dense uh, educational works, but also they're accessible. The way the visuals work, the way I can have layering of ideas, um, it feels accessible. This feels like something sort of light that you can read, but at the same time, it's really doing a lot more than you think possible. Uh, so I came and I said, this is what I want to do, and my advisors to be bought it for some reason. I have one in the audience sort of here, so he may make, answer why. Uh, and, and immediately I started making comics for my work, so sort of the, the proof was to make them. And so I was very fortunate as, as one of my committee members, uh, Maxine Green. How many Maxine Green fans are in the audience? How many Maxine Green not? The rest of you don't know who she is? Well, we should rectify that. Um, so Maxine Green was 90 when I had her. Uh, I had her in a class in her living room, a uh, philosophy of aesthetic education, a big proponent that the arts are a transformative educational experience. Uh, I made a comic about her, depicting her as a top in my first class, not knowing her at all. It apparently went over well, because I got to be a regular guest there after that. Um, this is on my website. I really recommend you learning about Maxine. So I was very fortunate to have this, and this is at my defense when she's 96 and my daughter is three weeks old. Uh, and I, I share this picture uh, mostly because I, I'm thinking about this 96-year-old whose eyes were really wide open even at that point, and she passed away about six weeks later. And I think about this three-week-old who might be asleep in the picture, but her eyes were really wide open in the same way that, that Maxine's were. And I think a big point about this work is thinking about how we keep our eyes open. So with that said, we'll talk about the work itself. Well, we won't. We're going to do one more. This was my other advisor, Ruth Vins, who's in there. She asked me to do a, a comic for her book on narrative research. And so I, I came up with this comic that's either on research or on drawing or on seeing. And it really depended on who you asked. And so that idea that you could look at that, that the way I was writing with visual and verbal metaphor made it somewhat unclear what it was I was talking about, and it depended on who you were, has been a big part of my approach, is how do I bring in people who have different levels of experience, different backgrounds of knowledge, but they can all read the work because I haven't kept them out with, with d domain specific words. I haven't kept them out in any way, so they can find their own, own way in. The trouble with that is that they think it's about many different things. But I really like that. I like that it can be a different experience for each person. Uh, so here we go. We'll talk a little bit about unflattening. So unflattening, uh, it was, it was to a way to push back against flatness. And by flatness, I didn't mean something literal at all. I, I really meant a limitation of our possibilities, uh, something where we lacked a critical dimension to see our own circumstances. And I think more, uh, you know, that we might, we, we forget what might be and really accept things for this is how it is. I think it's a dangerous place to be. I think we have lots of choices in our lives, but they often are conscripted from a very early age, and it's hard to see that that's happening. So I, because I had this word unflattening, and I'll say more about it later, it, which came from how I thought about comic books, uh, because I had that and I had experience with the book Flatland, is there anybody in this room that knows Edwin Abbott's little more handful. So Flatland is the story of the geometric inhabitants of a two-dimensional world. It's an 1880s a Victorian novel by Edwin Abbott. Uh, and, and I had this, so I, I, I was very interested to use it. And, and so here you go. So the Flatlanders know these geometric creatures. And we're looking down on them, which you can't really do in Flatland. But they know how to move east and west and south and northwards. But they have no concept of upwards. They can't conceive of anything off the plane. So that's all, you know, for us, we can look down on a flatlander and say, that's pretty silly. 
but, but the question is, what is upwards for you and I? What are the directions that we can't think about because we can't see, because it's outside of our ability to think? And so I was really trying to ask that in a metaphorical question, is what are the directions that we need to, to, to liberate ourselves, to find ways to see? And that comes down quite literally to how we see. Um, and I think, you know, I'm coming out of a school of education, I think very much the school, the institution of education is fostering a kind of flatness. It fosters it when it's a recipe. Here's a series of steps that we take. Here is the ways that we do it. Um, and I think that's, we take our learning and we put it into boxes, whether it's a box of space, whether it's a boxes of time, your class goes from here to then, and then you start, stop thinking about that, or, or whether it's the box of subject. This is what you're doing here, and you, you study mathematics, and you must not be studying art. And so I think we take those boxes into ourselves and, and start to think they're true. And we start to think that if this guy studied mathematics and art, that's kind of an odd thing, right? Let's not tell him that he's also a pro tennis player at some part in his life, because that's really strange, because you're not supposed to do all those things. But I think these are artificial things that we've accepted and started to believe as being true. And it's not healthy for who we are. And so is it this fear that things are getting lined up into rows and rows and rows and rows may be like this. So why is 12-point type double-spaced, one and a half by one by one by one margins, the way learning is supposed to be presented? Is that, it's not to say that it's bad. It's to say, why is this the way that it is? Um, and I think this page talks about that. We could look back as far as Plato saying images are, sh are shadows of shadows, so we can't trust images. And we can think about Descartes' move to separate mind and body and say, well, you know, that the, the, we can't trust our senses. So we can only trust the mind. And so a thinking machine needs these little rows of code. And, and words are very efficient for that. But, but maybe not. Maybe we've lost something about how we think through our bodies that, that we need to bring back. And so a little bit, I looked at you know, the difference between thinking in words and, and pictures. And certainly, I mean, words are a much more linear way to do things, right? It's like dominoes. This goes to this, goes to this, goes to this. And an image, you know, where does an image start? Or how do you map it? What is the first part of an image? It's hard to say. It's all sort of interconnected. So it's not to say any of these things are better. It's to say that there are different ways of looking at our experience. So we can think about it in terms of, uh, we can think about it in terms of the globe. So we take the Earth, this big spherical thing, in order to put it on a map, you have to flatten it, right? You have to push it out. But you know, in the Mercator projection above, which is the one you're most familiar with, you know Greenland's not that big. You know that weird distortions happen because that's you taking a, a round thing and you're making it flat. So you can look at other ones, like Buckminster Fuller's Dimaxium map, where he puts it on a icosahedron first and then unfurls it. And his map, where the top one shows separations, like east and west, this one shows it all kind of connected. I'm not at all suggesting the middle, middle map is more correct. I'm just saying that it's a different way of looking at things. And so it's like anything. If I ask you what the weather's like and all you tell me is the temperature, at any, at you're leaving out you know, the humidity. You're leaving out the wind. You're leaving out is it cloudy or not. So that's not really giving me enough information. So anytime you give me just one channel, you leave out all these other things. And so the question of this book became, you know, what are we missing? What are we failing to see when we put our learning in only one channel? And what might we start to make visible when we come at it from more? And I, I put this in, so there's a page about my dog in here, which is really pleased to be able to do. I put my childhood superhero and my dog all in my dissertation. So all you doc students, be thinking about this. Um, so it was, it was in there initially sort of as an apology to say, look, I'm talking about ways of seeing, but really I mean ways of knowing. That's my metaphor for it. So it's, much, it's quite literal in the sense that it's, you know, I'm talking about comic books and I'm talking about how we, but, but I mean it much more broadly. So the dog, so we all know the dog's sense of smell is stronger than yours and mine, right? You know this. But what's really true about it is that it's more nuanced, which means I come to this podium and I see the color of it and I see the kind of shapes of it. And I, I can see that, but the dog comes up here, and it knows who was here an hour ago, and it knows who was here three hours ago, and it knows who spoke here on Monday, and maybe as far as a week back. And so it has access to layers of time kind of upwards that I don't have. And, and I think that's the important thing, is how do we bring those things into how we learn and how we teach? Um, you know, how do we bring those in rather than keeping them out? And so ultimately, unflattening is this ridiculously simple idea. And I always get sort of embarrassed when I say it out loud. 
But it's, you know, you look through this eye and you look through this eye and they don't give you the same information. It's not that this one is right and this one is wrong. It's that you need both. You need to navigate through both and they give you a different kind of picture of the world. Um, and so it's that, you know, how do we bring in multiple ways? And, and, and in doing so, how do we go from having a solitary perspective to having our own and then the viewpoint from another spot at the same time? How do we sort of displace our own sort of limited perspective and try to have multiple views? And I, I'll skip through that. And it's not, I, I, you know, this is a lot about twos, but it's not necessarily limited to two. We can come at three, at four, at however many things you bring into the picture. And so ultimately in doing that, I feel like you have a chance to not see things head on, but see that they have sides, see that they have dimensionality, see that you can go around them and that you can turn them and you can maybe even open them up. So for me, comics was A, this thing I loved to do and believed in from forever, but, but also a way to be amphibious. It meant I could breathe in the, la in the, wor in the worlds of image and text and maybe, just maybe get at some of the own bound my own boundaries in my thinking and step out of them and get a different picture of you know, what my limitations were and maybe find some new ways of working. And I think that, and we'll sort of end on that when I get there, um, that's very much been the case. So let's say a few words about comics. And I'm actually, this is a graphic novel prize, right? Yeah. Um, it's not a comic. So let, let me just grill the audience for one second here. What's the difference between comics and graphic novels? This would be a, Slight participatory thing. Who wants to feel the? Yeah. Oh, well, we got a ringer in the audience. That's good. It's we don't have that much time, so it's all right. But graphic novel is just a marketing term. <sighs> I really, I only just met him today, but he's great. You should take his class if you haven't. Um, yeah, and it's an effective marketing term. It's an effective one because I know for my, you know, I'll say, yeah, I did my dissertation in comics form, and people say, oh, you mean a graphic novel? And I'll say, okay. You know, if that makes you feel better, fine. That's what I did it in. And it's hard to know. I don't know what to, I say I work in comics, but obviously it has a spine. I could kill a large cockroach with it. It's different than the thing you get on your spinner rack. So there's, you know, there's a, the killing potential is definitely different between the two. Um, but I think what's really important, I mean, I, th I think we're here, you know, the, you, this, this sort of event wouldn't exist 50 years ago. It wouldn't exist 20 years ago. That we're, we're really starting to, embrace what comics are. And there's a little bit that we're embracing it as sort of a new form. And in some part, I mean, it's older than film, so that's definitely not quite true. But also, I think most importantly is to think about it as a lineage of us making sense of our world through images, which is as old as we are, as old as we've been human. We've been trying to make sense of our world this way. And I think the sad part about this is I can grill this audience and I say, how many of you can write? And everybody's going to answer yes. And I won't do it now. And if I ask how many of you draw, and that your hands, I'm going to get, you know, one out of ten maybe. Um, if Susan's class, more of them might say yes. But uh, we. So I think we've we, through the, the our institutions, we've sort of forgotten some of the things that really make us human. And something I, I think in my own teaching is something I want to awaken all the time: is that we do make, make sense of the world visually, and let's use it, see what we can get to. But anyway, I said I was going to talk about comics, so, so let's just do a little quick run through of how I think comics work. And I think depending on who you talk to about comics, they will give you a very different answer. And it's all sort of dependent on how they make comics themselves. So this will be mine. So when people in this audience, 1993, Scott McCloud made this book, or I guess it's a graphic novel, um, <laughs> called Understanding Comics, uh, where, which was really a sort of a I don't know, a cannon shot or something into the world of comics. It, it, this is this book about comics, in comics. And I think librarians, librarians really embraced it. And, and we owe a lot of gratitude to librarians. I'm not just saying that because I'm in a library, but this is a, that they, start, they recognized what these things could do and how important they were to education. And I think teachers got behind that you know, shortly after. And I think comics really have blossomed into being anything. They're not stuck in being a particular genre. They can be anything. And I certainly owe an enormous, uh, enormous debt to the existence of this work um, because now you know, I can make a, a somewhat similar thing. So Scott's definition says juxtapose pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. That's comics. That doesn't say anything about coming out once a month. It doesn't say anything else. It just says you put my fist here 
in a little box next to my fist here in another box. And you guys all make the action happen. You animate it. You breathe life into it. Um, and that's it. That's comics. And so that's one view of time as well. That's like, you know, we think about time from moment to moment, from spring to summer to fall to winter. This, this box to this box. And that was comics for him. And I think this is a very important place to start. So you can look at this page, and yes, you read it left to right, top to bottom in a sequential fashion. But because it's visual, you can't help but start to make connections from the lower right back up to the upper left and in multiple directions. And it makes my joke possible. All these separate fragments being connected, they're connected because you can see them all at once, which also means you start to see, you know, which do you read first, this part of the picture or the words? And maybe we can ask that. We'll ask one more participatory question. What do you read? Who reads text first when they read comics? Who reads the words first? No, I don't. Who reads the pictures first? Third option. Who's got another option? You can't tell the difference? OK. Third, is there another, a fourth option? Depends on the visual context. Depends on the visual context. Anybody page first and then? I get that a lot. I don't know. So the fact that we can even ask the question about what you read first is real. I mean, it, you don't, I don't hold up a page of text and you say, what do you read first? I don't think. I mean, maybe speed reading tricks, you do that. But so there's something going on that's both sequential and simultaneous. There's two kinds of ways of, of, of approaching the world that are happening at the same time. Um, and I think it's demonstrated well in this panel from Watchmen by Moore and Gibbons. And so in the center is, is clear meta commentary about how comics work. It says, there is no future, there is no past, you see. So the upper left, in some sense, certainly is first, right? It happens in the past. And this certainly happens in the future in relation to that one. But the fact is, this takes place 30 years earlier than the center. So time and space are sort of mashed up in this unusual way. And it allows for a lot of storytelling possibilities that, that don't really exist in other forms. The whole static nature of comics allows them to do something very dynamic. And so I think about this, you know, we've, we've had the left-right brain thing for a long time, and I think most of that's been thrown out recently, but it's, and it's been replaced with something that's probably going to be thrown out again. But the current view is that one side is responsible for sequential, sort of linear, focused activity, and one is for the more all-around awareness. And you can think about the value of that evolutionarily, is that you, know, you want to be focused on a task, be able to do something, but at the same time, you have to be aware of things so you're not eaten while you're doing that. Um, and so I think comics do that. They allow you to be focused and move through linearly, but also keep track of the all at once, all the things going on around you and the sort of tangents that your mind moves. So even though in this moment you're here, you're thinking about the next moment to do, 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 your thoughts, your thoughts are going tangentially, they're going sideways. And comics let you put both of those into the same place. And I want to show a couple examples of this sort of sequential and simultaneous. This is from a French comic on the Louvre. And so if I cut this up into nine panels and showed it to you as a slideshow, you'd certainly get the meaning. You'd read the different things. But what would you miss? You'd miss, you'd miss the triangle or the pyramid, which is representing. You'd miss the superstructure that the whole page makes. And that's important to the meaning of this page. It's Gasoline Alley from the 30s. You know, our character is bumbling through sequentially through the scene, but the scene is all one simultaneous thing. So there's these two ways of reading going on at the same time. I'm going to let you read this one and laugh. So the only way this character can get to the fruit is because he lives in a comic book. And time and space are on, they're, on, they're inextricable here. So, you know, they have properties that really allow us to do different things. And to me, I think that's, you know, we can really take advantage of that. So this page is about, uh, it's talking about, it's a chapter on routine or ruts. And it's contrasting sort of the out and back commute that most people have with my wife's commute in Manhattan, which was different every day and different patterns and it was always, it was always different which gave her a very different view of the city than I had, because I mostly did out and backs. So I didn't know all these other connections that she did. Uh, but I could have represented, here's one and here's the other, sort of an illustrational fashion. 
But I'm really interested in how much I can do with the very shape of the page, the sort of meta, the meta drawing that is the whole, that to, to get the ideas across rather than illustrating the, the text. So in this case, in the background, the out and back is repeated as a grid. So the grid is sort of in the background going like that. And in the foreground, I had noticed the coincidence of a falling leaf or feather with the shape of Manhattan as I was out for a run. And I saw this thing sort of drift. And I thought, that's what she's doing. She drifts through the city. She's making different moves all the time. So those two things are happening at the same time. And so by unflattening, when I first thought of the word, it was really about how much density of information is going on in what is a very flat space. And how do we even say something's on top of something else? Because it's all just flat drawing but yet it feels like it's on top. And we read it as that because we can move back and forth. We can connect things visually, but we can also keep them apart. So for me, and this is not from the book, this was a piece for the Boston Globe last year on entropy, which is very scientific, but uses none of that language. But here I really, it was about the idea that things, entropy is about things running downhill, but also there are these brief moments where things go back against the stream, and that was the idea was that life is one of these things. And, and so the page is very linear at the top. It's sort of do, 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 marches. And then I wanted to show the stream going down, but I also wanted how do I have you experience that sort of going back up? And so the page itself is, so it brings you down a little bit, goes up to there, and then you read, and you spiral through, and you come back out here. And it takes a little while to figure out. So at some point, though, you are forced to read right to left, and you're forced to read bottom to top, two things you don't normally do in your reading, at least not in this culture. You don't do the like, right to left. So it's the very way you read the page, the very way you experience the ideas is part of what the ideas are about. And I think that's something comics can really be leveraged to take advantage of even more than they already do. Um, and something I'm very excited about. How much can I get the page itself to embody an idea? And that brings me to this question, which I may not ask you all, but it's like, what do our thoughts look like? In our, before you put them down on paper or on something, do they look like lines and lines and lines, or do they look like some linear bits with some moving bits with some things that are going off in multiple directions? Personally, I think comics are a really good way at getting at that. This is Chris Ware, a previous winner I hear, um, who, you know, he has, he has these sequential moments, but then all these tangents and the way that your memory is sort of off these little fragments that are back there. So part of this argument is that comics are this amazing way to represent the complexity of our experience. But I want to sort of turn in the closing part to how they can generate um, ideas. And so the minute we make a mark on a piece of paper, our visual system, which is always going out into the world making relationships, I'm always judging you're next to that, you're in front of that, I'm figuring out all this stuff about the world. The minute you make a mark on something, you start to make relationships. You start to see things in the clouds that aren't there because that's how your eyes work. And so for me, the act of, the act of making drawings is like having a conversation with myself. That means I had a partner in making, you know, I worked solitary, but I had a partner in that my drawings were teaching me where to go with the work the whole time. And I think this is a really important thing about making drawings for students and for anyone, is that you can learn from your own drawings. And so people ask me all, this t all the time, like, what do you do first, words or pictures? And I say, yes. Um, and it's, it's only a little bit to be funny, but it's mostly to say that, yes, that I, I have some words and I have some pictures, and they start talking to each other. And my job is to pay attention to them, is to really pay attention to what they're saying to each other and make more of them until the, until the idea turns into something more solid. Um, and I really, I could labor on this, and we could come back to it if there's questions. I really like the, the, Harvard allowed me to reproduce a few of my sketches, and I put a ton of them on my website. But this was the very first one I made before, a few years before it was finished. And I like sharing it because of two reasons. I mean, I, I think one, for people who don't draw or don't paint or don't sing, when you, when you see a finished thing, it looks like magic. It's like, I could never, I can't do that. But I think when you see the sort of, muddling that we figure our way out and how the ideas sort of emerge through the very tool, that, that it becomes something you can do. And also, I think it's important to say that this isn't a picture of what my thinking looks like. This is my thinking. Without this, this book does, it's not like I wrote a book and then I said, what are the pictures that go with it? I made things like this, and I made more things like this, and I made a few thousand more things like this, and eventually it told me what I was supposed to do. 
Um, I'm not very mystic at all, mystical at all, but I really do believe that the work is it, the work is taking me places and is far smarter than I would be without it. So I want to I want to sort of wrap with one uh, example more specific about how how the drawings actually made me do more research than I would have anticipated. So in the chapter on imagination, I've, I had in mind a page about stories and the transformative potential of them. And I, very early on, and this is probably in the first few sketches, just laying it all, all out, um, I thought about Scheherazade and the Knight's Tales um, and the sort of stories within stories. I thought, well, that's a good thing to use. Um, and so I was playing with that. And folks in here may be familiar with the, the children's book Zoom, where you're like, there's a postcard, and then you, you turn the page, and you zoom in on it, and you realize that they're watching TV. And it's, you never know what, what's real, because you keep getting in. And there's also the film Powers of 10 uh, by the Eames, where you're like, you're looking at somebody's hand, and then your, your power of 10 closer. And you, anyway, I was interested in having this series of zooms. So the stories within stories would be either you know, literally zooming in or metaphorically doing it, or zooming out. But I got to the middle of the page, and in the middle, I knew that I wanted to talk about science. And I said, by, by stories, I don't just mean the fanciful, but I also mean things like science. Had I been writing, I would have said, I also mean things like science, and put a period and been done with the page. But I wasn't. So I needed to find some way to both embody this idea and, and to visually embody that idea. What was, the, what was right? So I spent a long time trying to figure out you know, what works with the visual sort of constraint I've made up. and what works within the story that I'm trying to tell on this page. So I started looking at the time that the Knight's Tales had been written down, 1300, you know, um, the, the Arab Golden Age. So I'm looking at where they were written and when they were written down, and looking for something scientific. And I stumbled upon a work by a man named al uh, whose work was picked up 300 years later, uncredited by Copernicus, to do his revolutionary work. And I already had this page about Copernicus, and he'd been part of the thing. And I was so excited, and I was like, this is it. So I spent about three weeks researching, researching this guy's astronomical calculations, trying to understand them well enough, and trying to figure out how the page worked well enough um, so that I could do what ultimately became these three little panels in the corner. You know, to condense it, make sense of it, and make sense of it in a way that I could share it with other people and that it tied into my narrative. And what's important to say about that is there's nothing in my notes, or my outline, my anything that says you should include something on obscure Arab astronomy from the 13th century. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing about getting an education, dissertation, doctorate, whatever, that you should do that except that the demands of the drawing said, you need something that makes this work on a few different, the constraints I set up sent me looking there. Um, and I think that's really important. So I want to I wanna show a, one piece of student work to wrap this up. Uh, so I, I teach these classes where I, from day one, I have them draw. And I have, I'd say 95% of my students consider themselves non-drawers to start the class. And this student was incredibly shy. I do have permission to share this. Um, but incredibly shy, but did, and, and not, you know, these are not the kind of drawings that you sort of think of as we put these on museum walls. These are about just slightly beyond stick figures. Um, but she made this amazing comic uh, for her concluding thing, and, and, and I think it's worth looking at. And so, you know, so we don't see her face. She has all these words. She used the comics form, she used the, the panel as something both to look through, as something to be trapped by, as something to go through. It was all a big, you know, she was thinking about all those issues. And then finally, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, I'll read it off the screen. Uh, so she makes her own box out of words, sounds, and pictures, and soon she learns that there is no need for borders, that boxes restrict her unnecessarily, since she can go anywhere she wishes. And, I mean, this is like one of the most po powerful things I've ever seen. Um, and you wouldn't say, like, in terms of craft, this is not, this isn't like the high end of craft. And in, so there's this other level. And, but in terms of, sorry, in terms of thinking, this is like the highest thing I could, I've seen. In terms of what she understood about herself and what she was able to express through this, really changed her. So I think the important thing for her and the important thing for me is that working visually, it's not just that it made it accessible. It's not just that it was a different outlet for it. It's that it changed what I was able to do and how I was able to figure out things. And I see that in my own students. So 
But I think the ultimate message to close on here is, you know, when we encourage the other modes, the other kinds of upwards that all of us have as part of learning, as part of how we teach, we embrace that. I think we, you know, rather than narrowing who people are, we find that they go in all kinds of directions that they don't know that they're going to go, that we can't anticipate. And I think that's really, you know, if there's one thing to leave you with, is I think that's it. I think we have to figure out how people learn and let them, really let them be who they need to be. So thank you. We have time for a few questions. I'm curious, Nick, you're uh, just listening to you talk and then looking at your work and your drawings, there's such a physicality mm -hmm. uh, to your drawings and what you say, and I'm just wondering how you uh, use the actual tactile world and the other senses to actually inform both your drawing and actually both your teaching and your creative process. Tell me just a little bit more. I, I like it. I mean, I like what you're thinking about, but I don't know what, where I yeah, should I'm jump just in. You basically deal with drawings mm -hmm. in, your, in, in text, and I'm just curious how essential the, the world, our other senses, smell, taste, tactility, experiential learning, how, how critical is that to what you do? I mean, in terms of my own work, I'd say less so. Um, in terms of what I think we ought to in, learn to teach and learn to figure out ways to do, I think absolutely. Um, you know, my own work is very much about the practice of comics. Uh, and and that, again, the reason for the dog page is to say, look, this is me, but that just happens to be how I am. I'm not a dog, um, but other people have these things. So I, I mean, it's an interesting thing. As somebody who got away with this dissertation in comics form, um, <laughs> To think about, you know, if I had a performance major as a student, uh, what would they, you know, and I think it would take some work to like, how do we think about this? And you, you maybe need that sort of trailblazer or whatever to show you how to think about it. But I'd be really interested. I mean, I'd be really, I, I think it makes sense. I don't, I don't know that I have the tools to get it, but I think I hope I have the tools to listen to it when it comes, if that, if that answers it a little bit. I'm just wondering how much, how cognizant you are of making those connections. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think I'm going to have a great answer to it. I mean, I think there's so much about, and I don't think I talked about it here, but, you know, getting stuck on things and needing to, like, figure out what is this word. And, and I mean, I really do. I definitely, when I'm thinking of the page, like, how should this move? And I'm, so I'm very aware of it physically, uh, not, certainly not uh, whatever you say for smells. Um, and I'm also aware of the fact that if I'm stuck, I run. And if I, you know, like, like that feather page where the thing drifted down, it's both me thinking about it and knowing that there's, there's, very, there's very much something about the act of moving um, that changes how what we're able to think. And I know the cartoonist Linda Berry is, talks about this all the time. You know, the act, right, typing at a computer can really be stifling to us, but keeping your hand in motion all the time allows you to think in ways you, that you don't. Um, and I know for me, you know, I, I am frequently stuck and that I start making marks and I see, so it's mostly seeing, but I think it's probably also moving. I just don't know that I know enough about the, the latter, but I really like thinking about that. Thank you. Oh, this corner is very active. It's good. Um, I have a question about your choice um, of using an, or not color in this and how that might have influenced, may or may not influence your concepts you put forth in the book. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first off, it's economical. Uh, I give away, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have any today because I, I, I moved and I don't have a new printer yet. Um, I give away samples of this to conferences, to talks, to cab drivers, to waiters, to people on my street. I, I give comics away all the time because I made stuff to be read. So printing in color is expensive. I don't know why. I don't understand. It's 2016. Why it makes any difference whether the ink is color or black and white? But it still seems to be. So that's partly it's economical, um, or the economics of it. Secondly, I don't think I'm very good at color. I mean, uh, I did I did a piece for Nature um, this past year for the journal Nature on climate change, and that is all in color. And it's it's another kind. It's another dimension to think about um, that I don't feel as confident in 
or um, and it's and it's just a whole. You know, I do all of it myself, so it's it. You know, I think future projects I probably will, but I'll say. Uh, let me see my clicker here. I have extra slides in case you ask questions. Um, so this is a page on multimodality, and I actually have the whole sequence of how it developed, if you want. But um, had I been working in color, so for those who don't know the word multimodality, it's like things in, in addition to the word spoken between us, the exchange of the actual sort of bits of language, the, the ways we move our hands, the ways we hold our face, action, image, gesture, color are all part of communication. So the page was about that. So if I'd been using color, it would have been a completely different page. This is one that's very clear to point to because I would have been able to like rely on that. And here, I kind of play like on that sort of keyboard thing up at the top, there's a few like sort of texture, like wavy things versus, which had I stuck to even this idea, I, I would have played with color a lot in that small way or in a huge way. Um, I, I think it would have been a dramatically different page. So I, that's a great question. I'm just curious. Um... Uh, it's funny to ask this question where you're receiving an award for uh, the book. Are you working on a, new, a book now? Are you willing to share if you're working on a book and what it's about? Um, well, uh, yeah, that's, this is the first time I actually can answer that, so I don't feel quite so. Um, yeah, uh, my, my editor is pitching it next week, so yes. Uh, we, we made up a title and everything. Um, not going to stick to it. Um, in terms of what's next, I... Maybe talking it out loud will help me do it, because I did a lot of this in uh, talking out loud. Um, I feel like this made a very strong argument that, that this is permissible, that, that you know, visual argument is something. You know, I think that hopefully that argument's over. We don't have to do it anymore. Though I'll admit, when I came to school, I thought that argument was over. I assumed that the existence of Mouse and Persepolis and Fun Home meant you didn't have to prove it anymore. You could just go ahead and make whatever you wanted. Um, but that wasn't quite true. Um, but I feel like the question I often get is from, uh, it's, I get it, that makes sense to me, but I don't draw. And so a lot of what my classes have been, that, that last little bit of the talk, we're getting people to work, is that, that I'm very interested to make something that talks about how you can get yourself into that place um, and maybe is helpful in how to do it, but never appears to be doing any of those things. So forget you heard that if you see the actual thing. Um, but I think that's, I mean, to me, that's the question. I, mean, I think what's, I started doing this because I, I, I knew comics were a way I could reach people with, I'm sorry, I'll back up one more step. I, I have a lot of gaps in my education history I, and, you know, for various reasons, but um, between degrees. And they're mostly because I loved what I did in the academy, but I really didn't like that it stayed there and it sort of stopped at that wall. And so when I returned to comics, you know, sort of full on, I realized that that was a way that I could do the kind of thinking I wanted to do, but also reach people that don't often get included in those conversations. So it started, a, you know, I made comics because of that reason, but I think in the process of doing it and sort of reflecting on doing it, I realized how much my work was different because I was working in comics from the start and that my comics were sort of teaching me how to make new comics. So I feel like something that really plays on how your thinking changes is really important to me. Um, and I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do it, but stay tuned, I guess. I see. We have uh, one more question here. Oh. In your comic book uh, or graphic novel. No, 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 Steve, stop while you're ahead. You're good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, that you use a lot of different styles, sometimes yeah. radically different styles on each page, sometimes very different styles on the same page yeah. on, on, each of the, on each of the graphics. Um, and you also use a lot of different disciplines. Yeah. Why do you, why do, you do that? Is, is Which it, part, both? Oh, or, or both. Is it just is it to uh, uh, make it uh, harder on us so that we have to like, think three-dimensionally or, or across different modes of thinking? Or, or what, what's the... Uh... Uh, it's certainly not to make it harder. Um, certainly not to make it easy either. Uh, I'd say, so the different styles, I mean, I think each idea needs to be done in the way it needs to be done. I mean, you know, this isn't a narrative book about, you know, there's no characters, there's no story that runs through. So the hardest challenge for me as a maker is 
is each page I have to like figure out what I'm going to do from scratch cuz like in fact since I have the slide will you permit me to go through slides for a second yes please so this is a page on on multimodality as we've discussed and so and this I'll get to your question honestly um, my first idea for multimodality was how about an omelet so an omelet, you know, you have all these separate flavors, but they come together, but they're still, it's not like a smoothie where everything's sort of blended. It's like, you know, there's a green pepper there and there's a mushroom. You still know it is the thing it is, but it it's also makes a whole. So that sounded kind of good in many levels, um, but I didn't love it. So I started thinking about what about a keyboard? So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this keyboard and like, because you press different keys, each key is giving you a different kind of input. And that's, that was kind of interesting. And then I, by accident, or I don't know, maybe not by accident, but I drew an orchestra pit. So they're like, you know, that's a pretty common metaphor for multimodality. Like the violins play, the whatever, all the, the winds, all the other instruments, they play, and they're all separate, but they have to be together, right? But I noticed when I was making the drawing that, that this, this keyboard and this way I had drawn the orchestra pit weren't that dissimilar. And in fact, that maybe the, the, the conductor spot was like the space bar. So that was kind of an interesting coincidence. Um, and, and it turns out that early typewriters, many of them were arranged just like that. So now I was like, well, that's interesting. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. So I think I tried the omelet again. So then I, <laughs> what's that? I missed that. I missed the joke. You can't leave me out of the. All right, anyway, um, I'll assume it was nice. Um, so then I'm thinking about, so this was a sketch, I'm like, well, there's the brain and like you have all these things, but it's got to come out through one channel. So, that, so I made this sketch, but I made it and I think I remade it again and I'm like, wow, that looks a little bit like the keyboard that I had drawn, which is also an orchestra pit. Um, so that, now I'm excited because now there's an idea. And so uh, let's just say a little bit more about it. So now the idea is kind of formed, but I want to have this like little opening paragraph, and because I can't use color, I had to do it this way. It's like, here's the paragraph, and then here's the larger idea, right? Now in comics, the hard part, if you have something like this, you want to keep going down. So I needed to do something that got you back up into this page, because the way you write, I mean, the, the way that you're experiencing matters. So I was really struggling with that. Um, I think I was pretty excited about the other parts of it. But I was like, how do I get you back up to there? You can see the arrow attempt. Like, I know where I want you to go. And so the, the cheating method would be to draw an arrow. So there's this arrow, right? But I'm looking at that arrow I drew. I noticed how much that arrow, at least to me, looked like my thumb on it. And so and then I'm like, oh my goodness, a, hand, a thumb, you know, there it is. I've already made a keyboard. Why didn't I think of a thumb? Maybe I'm just slow. My drawings are a little faster. Um, so then I was all excited. So now I've got this idea. There's the hand, there's the hand. The hand helps you get back up. And then, you know, it's pretty, pretty clear how you get back up into the page. I, I was kind of a long version to answer your question because it doesn't really answer it at all. But, um, <laughs> but I think each, I mean, it's a little bit like talking about multimodality. Each idea needs to be drawn a certain way. And I'll say, like, the first chapter is this very densely, like, I'm talking about flatness, but every page has an infinite depth to it. Like, there's a lot of, I drew a lot of people on those things. Um, and it also is like this very rendered style that people recognize. And it was very intentional for me because I wanted to show, I wanted to hit you in the face with the fact that I could draw. And so if there was a skeptical audience that said, we shouldn't let somebody do a doctorate and dissertation, the first chapter was going to punch you and say, yes, he can. And so that by the third or fourth chapter, when things started to like some of the, you know, the, the structure starts to break down, um, that I could be much more playful with how I drew it. So, so that's part of it. Um, the style change, you know, like I said, I, there's times when drawing like a Batman comic makes sense to me. There's time when drawing something else. I mean, I think my own limitations is something I'd like to continue to, when you ask about our next project, is to push my own drawing to do other things. I still, there's only so much I can do. And in terms of disciplines, I mean, this is, this is by many people a book about interdisciplinarity and the importance of not being boxed in. Um, you know, I, I think, I mean, humans are, I mean, we're really interesting creatures. 
right? Like, I, I'm not just a comics maker or just, a, just anything. I mean, just is one of the worst words in our language. Um, so why not use as many things as I, any, as many tools as I can use, whether it's drawing tools or whether it's disciplinary tools? And also, in doing so, hopefully, you know, what, what do you study here? Communication. So somebody with communications can read it, and you read it as if it's one thing. But people from ed school read it as if it's a different thing. So why not let them all have a chance to read it as opposed, you know, it's, it's an, it, it makes it a slight issue for shelving. I don't know where it's, <laughs> so this is a, this is a true story. I, I got an email from a guy in France who went to get it from his library before the French edition came out. But, um, and he said the librarians told him they couldn't decide where to put it, so they put it in storage. Which I thought, I mean, whatever, that's funny. It's a, I mean, it's, so it's a, I mean, I, I've seen it next to Spinoza in philosophy, and I've seen it next to Spiegelman in graphic novels, and both seem like good places to be. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that's who we are, and I feel like I'm going to demonstrate that in whatever, I mean, that, you know, so. So we, um, thank you all for yeah, coming. Thank you. And Thank you, Nick, for uh, getting your doctorate in a way like no other. And uh, there are books for sale you can buy on flattening, and Nick's going to uh, autograph right up front. <laughs>